so decline if you see there are certain internal factors like uh, success and struggles could have been there and economic strain also is there so the maintenance of the vast empire it became increasingly expensive the cost of main, main, maintaining large army and dealing with external threats for dealing with external threats it has become costly and unmanageable social discontent is also there good evening students welcome back to plutus is right today is our 63rd day right today is our 63rd day and today we are going to study about the gupta empire or gupta uh, gupta empire also so after the mauryas uh, if we leave the shatavahanas period so we can say guptans are the uh, another prominent dynasty so shatavahanas also we cannot consider the consider them as less their contribution also in the fields of whether it is police polity and for that matter in the art and architecture also etc so they have also contributed a lot so after satvahanas he uh, pataliputra as the center pataliputra or the patna as uh, uh, i mean capital of uh, the empire so one more dynasty emerged that is known as the guptan dynasty or the guptan empire so uh, we can say after the mauryas they have had the greatest territorial extent until until the time of we can say delhi sultanate or for that matter the uh, mughal mughal empire so after the after the mauryas uh, they had the greatest extent, de, uh, greatest uh, territorial we can say control over india most parts of the country control over the most part of the country um, after the mauryas right so i mean they have they are known for uh, some uh, some things especially uh, earlier historians used to call this age as golden age right golden age right so there are they have taken several reasons one reason because uh, we know here most of i mean we uh, know details about the most of the things uh, we can say with certain i mean uh, what i meant to say is we have lot of information to know about the kings here so because of that we know about chandragupta 1 chandra uh, samudragupta and chandragupta 2 so like that through the puranas especially uh, we know the lineage and the uh, lineage of the kings and similarly we have lot of information about the kings so because of that reason uh, some historians have called this age as the age of uh, golden age, age of uh, we can say golden age swarna yuga uh, but however the modern historians or the marxist historians oppose this name uh, however they acknowledge uh, the growth and uh, growth and development of art and architecture art and architecture um and in the fields of science and technology uh in the field of literature also literature uh science and technology we will see the varaha mihra varaha mihra brahma gupta and shishruta etc we hear many uh, scientist names literature also we will see uh, the i mean kalidasa the greatest poet of india we can say kalidasa uh if we see his works if we observe his work so the content he is discussing the geographical features he is discussing uh we can attribute kalidasa to the time period of uh, time period of guptans only and uh, maybe most probably he might be hailing from the kashmir region of india so kalidasa is associated with the guptans so he is a greatest uh, he is one of the greatest play writers not only in india but across the across the world we can consider him one of the greatest play writers right so if we see other features uh, other uh, we can say uh, areas 
uh, I mean there is flourish there is flourish in each and every aspect of the we can say other aspects including administration they have also provided uh, a centralized and also efficient administrative systems so all these features are there achievements are there but uh, some historians especially the marxist historians they have opposed the opposed to calling this age as the golden age because they had problem with uh, they are uh, they have problem with one thing that is uh, emergence of caste system emergence of caste system we can say during the guptan period only uh, the varna system completely transformed into the strict uh, caste system and also it became a rigid system with the hierarchies i mean one caste is uh, lower than the other and one caste is higher than the other so a proper we can say uh, some uh, some kind of we can say rigidity has come into the caste system and the caste being decided based on the birth right so because of this reason uh, some of the historians oppose calling this age as the age of golden uh, i mean golden age however recognizing the development growth and development in other areas this age can be called as the age of classicism age of classicism age of classicism right so uh, we can say this is the brief overview of this dynasty and uh, try to know about the views of the different uh, we can say streams of uh, historians also you should be aware of this one right so this is if we see the time period broadly they were rule, uh, ruling in the 4th century to 6th century ad uh, the years are <coughs> 319 to 467 ad right so founding and rise so after the mauryas they are the more predo- um, major dominant dynasty uh, in the indian history right Uh, for this uh, dynasty chandragupta i he is considered as the founder of the dynasty and he is also one of the greatest rulers of the dynasty right so uh, about the golden age we have already discussed here so some historians call it golden age because because of the strong lineage of the kings and the flourish uh, flourish and the growth and development in various areas but other historians uh dispute this uh, they do i mean it's not a, they say that it's not a golden age because we also see uh one of the social disabilities uh that is i mean caste system it is considered as the one of the social disabilities that has also consolidated in this period so because of that reason uh they dispute that it is not a golden age however we can uh, recognize the de- growth and development ad- in other fields like science mathematics astronomy literature art and architecture etc uh, this period is also known for some renewed scholars like kalidasa aryabhatta and varaha mehra right administration they have they have established a well organized uh, and centralized administration just like the mauryans but if you see <coughs> it is not we can say well organized and efficient uh, and centralized as that of the mauryan administration or the bureaucracy similarly apart from that we will also see a hint of feudalism feudalism becomes a very very important topic in the later part of the history from here on so throughout the medieval age we will see the aspect of feudalism <coughs> so uh in the guptan age we will see a hint of uh, feudalism in the form of donations land donations land donation <coughs> land donations being made to brahmins brahmins uh that is known as the uh, agraharas uh land donations land uh, along with that the associated village and whatever the taxes that are coming from that uh, village they have been completely given to the brahmins those villages are known as agraharas right so here 
later the earlier the donations were for the brahmins and later the whatever the bureaucrats or we can say the important uh, members of the court they are there they have given or assigned some areas land and associated villages they have been assigned to the important officials of the court and they were uh, paying taxes to the king and they are maintaining military they were maintaining military and whenever the king calls <coughs> uh, the army to assemble and come to the war the uh, <coughs> the lord whatever the feudal lord is there he has to obey and he has to come to the uh, come to the uh, he has to answer the call so that is broadly known as the feudal system especially land area be is being given to a noble right so we will see a hint of feudalism that is emerging in the guptan age and by the medieval time by the age of <coughs> by the medieval age it has grown by leaps and bounds and the entire kingdom has come to be dependent on the feudalism only feudalism only so right when we discuss medieval india so this feudalism becomes very very important topic and how uh, feudalism uh, it has different names uh, in the different periods so generally uh, the name that is uh, in the medieval age that came to be known as the zamindari system and the moguls uh, after the after uh, akbar he reigned he uh, developed a new system that is known as mansabdari system and the features are similar to that of the zamindari system only mansabdari system so uh, for the one of the major reasons for the decline of the mogal empire is the, the failure of the mansabdari system i mean uh, i mean because of the we can say um, uh, because of the extremes in the mansabdari system like growing continuously the rank uh, there are like satyan and jabar this this is called the rank system rank is dependent dependent on the two terms that is sat and jawar so we will see when we discuss the mughal uh, mughal period time we will see this aspect so because the nobles were rising but there was no land available to give to them so because of this crisis this particular crisis is known as uh, mansabdari crisis it arised during the age of aurangzeb during the period of aurangzeb so we largely we can say it is a mismanagement because of the mismanagement of the mansabdari system uh, there arose the mansabdari crisis and uh, uh, there arose the mansabdari crisis and because of this reason uh, it is considered as one of the reasons for downfall or decline of the mughal empire so everything is connected from the guptan period to the mughal period uh, we can connect uh, the history through the feudal feudalism or the feudal system so because of this reason i mean it is not at all favorable to the common people who are tilling who basically work on the land and who toil on the land so after achieving independence we have chosen the indian government has chosen to uh, we can say remove the system and for that matter we have brought the land reforms right so we will uh, see this everything uh, whenever the relevant topic comes okay right so uh, we will see what well, the point i was uh, trying to make is a hint of feudal system also we will see here so they have provided an efficient administrative system uh, the empire was uh, divided into provinces districts and villages the respective vocabulary for that we will see later in this lecture only and also apart from that they have developed a complex tax system so decline so apart from other reasons the decline of the guptans are also uh we can say linked to the attacks from the huns these are the central asian uh, central asian tribes so the inter- central asian intrusions we have studied in the post maurya topic also so many series of central asian invasions have come they have uh, i mean they have had their empires in uh, uh, connecting the lands from iran to afghanistan pakistan and most parts of india so they have had their uh, kingdoms also however the huns choose to repeatedly attack and uh, go away so because of their attacks violent attacks they treated war as a sport so they are a violent tribe so because of uh, huns uh, uh, recurrent uh, attacks 
the empire the western border has weakened and also the central authority also uh, they could not have the proper means to face these huns attacks so because of the uh, reason the empire has we can say the regional rulers became powerful and they have declared independence because of that the guptan empire has ceased to exist all right so this is about the decline there are other reasons also we will also see the what are the other reasons all right so the uh, age it is uh, the guptan age if you see it fostered a cultural and intellectual renaissance so because of this reason uh, this reason it this particular age though there is dispute about calling this age as golden age we can comfortably call it as age of classicism classicism right so if you see the brief uh, we can say growth and development or achievements of this age ex a uh, beautiful art and architecture has been created uh, in temples we can see lot of temples sculptures and also we will see cave paintings right advancements in science and technology mathematics and also uh, including the development of decimal system also we will see right flourishing literary works now they are recognized and uh, uh, due credit is given to them like plays like abhignana shakuntalam and epics like ramayana and mahabharata they have been like put down to writing epics like ramayana and mahabharata for that matter the puranas also they have been put down to writing so earlier they were in just in memory they were uh, kept they have i mean they have been maintained in the memory through recitation they have been uh, <coughs> kept living through the recitation and the memory now during the guptan guptan age they have been put into writing right so these are the some of the achievements if important rulers if we see in the guptan age sri gupta he is considered as the uh, sorry chandragupta one was the earlier i said chandragupta one was the founder sorry he is considered as a real founder and consolidator however to begin with the dynasty is began by sri gupta he is the first ruler uh, the dynasty was founded by sri gupta later gatotkacha gupta gupta he is the second ruler he is the son of sri gupta, uh, uh, sri gupta. if we see the famous and the most dominant guptan uh, kings there are we will see a series of five strong and important guptan rulers so because of them only the kingdom or empire has been consolidated and uh, i mean it flourished not only uh, in terms of administration but also in terms of art and architecture science and technology and also literature due to <coughs> patronage patronage of the these particular kings so among them the kings are chandragupta one samudra gupta he is also among the guptas he is considered as the most and most important and most famous he is a renowned as the napoleon of the east or indian napoleon because of his military strategy and achievements next is chandragupta he is also very important ruler uh, kumara gupta and skanda skanda gupta also contributed uh, we can say enough for the growth and development of the guptan empire late later we will see a series of a uh, few lead a uh, few weak rulers uh, followed sanda gupta including kuru gupta kumara gupta 2 and buddha gupta and vishnu gupta right so after that uh, we will see a, uh, we can see a decline because of the various uh, various reasons including weak rulers attack from the attacks from the uh, huns and also uh, there are another internal factors like administration become too costly and the king was unable to maintain the revenues uh, i mean uh, mean he could not able to balance the administration and the revenues so because of all these reasons the empire has declined right so if we see about the chandragupta uh, important ruler so his rule is uh, he ruled from 319 to 335 he is the first among the uh, great guptan kings right right 
so he laid the groundwork for the rise of the empire right so if we see the consolidation and expansion uh, during his time strategic marriages so chandragupta uh, known for his marriage with lichavi princess kumara devi so this uh, marriage alliance marriage with the lichavi, lichavi princess kumara devi it gave him the uh, more advantage advantage like uh, it gave him the significant political and military support so because of this marriage alliance mari- matrimonial alliance the lichavi support has uh, i mean he garnered the support of the lichavi kingdom right military campaigns he is credited with expanding the gupta territories uh, and uh, success i mean he successfully conquered the neighboring territories in and around the pataliputra right so because of his uh, i mean according to his territorial successes or because of the expansion of the empire he assumed the title or adapted adapted the title maharaja the raja that is great king of kings so there are already kings because he has conquered conquered them and he if uh, he is the chandragupta one so he conquered these territories and acquired control over them so already there are kings so he assumed the title of maharaja adhiraja so become king of the kings so from here on the maharaja adhiraja this title has been uh, we can say almost taken by every each and every king that uh, those came after uh, the kings and whenever they assumed the throne they have taken this title maharaja the raja right so this is one thing another thing is he is responsible for creating strong centralized administration so he laid the foundation for that also uh, next is the most important and uh, uh, significant ruler in the entire gupta dynasty that is the samudra gupta right so his reign is attributed from 335 bc to sorry ad to 375 ad so effectively he ruled for uh, almost 40 years right so he is considered as the one of the greatest rulers of uh, gupta dynasty and also he is considered as the one of the uh, greatest rulers of india also right so he is both known for both one side is military conquest and other side for the contribution or we can say patronage for the art and architecture and literature right so he is son of the chandragupta one right uh, military campaigns so because of his prowess in the military campaigns he his uh, he is renowned as the uh, Nap- napoleon of india because of his extensive military campaigns right so because of his uh, i mean expansion he assumed this i mean he is known as the napoleon of india so the famous allahabad inscription allahabad pillar inscription inscription uh, through this inscription we will come to know about the territorial expansion of the samudra gupta so it is alternatively called as the allahabad prashasti allahabad prashasti right because it is known as prashasti because it is i mean the whatever the inscription is laid it is laid for praising the achievements of the samudra gupta only so interestingly the allahabad pillar inscription it has written on the pillar that is laid down by ashoka so ashoka ashokan pillar is there ashoka installed a pillar here in allahabad allahabad so you know very well that ashoka uh, apart from writing on the rocks he has installed some pillars also and there his inscriptions have been laid down so uh, samudra gupta his administration administrators found a pillar an interesting pillar and there is large space left out on that pillar so they have laid another inscription in the name of samudra gupta on that particular pillar only however it is known as allahabad prashasti or allahabad pillar inscription it is commissioned by samudra gupta so it has the details of his entire military campaigns right so majorly uh, his conquest can be divided into six strategies he has assumed six strategies 
when he waged war and uh, acquired territories right so types of some of the important types of his uh, conquests or strategies are elimination so he completely annexed some kingdoms uh, incorporate incorporating their territories within his own kingdom so mostly he followed this territory this strategy for the, the neighboring kingdoms that are immediately uh, neighbor in neighbor in neighborhood of uh, pataliputra he adopted this also because it becomes easy to control the nearby territories right so here he followed the strategy of complete elimination next is subjugation so for other kingdoms they were divided uh, i mean which are divided by samudra gupta he forced them to pay tribute to the guptas acknowledging their supremacy right so this uh, he adopted this strategy for little bit some more distant kingdoms there it is uh, it becomes easy and possible uh, possible for him to exert his authority on the kings whatever the uh, local kings are there next is another uh, we can say uh, strategy is uh, alliances so some of the uh, samudra gupta ent- entered into former strategic alliances with other su- some other kings expanding his influence without direct control so apart from that in the coastal area present coastal in the area of andhra pradesh odisha so there were some tribal kingdoms so he uh, waged war on them and uh, defeated them however he restored their authority i mean he restored the kingdom to the previous kings only so he, in this way his influence has expanded so these are the strategies that have been adopted by samudra gupta right in total there are six strategies so if we see the extent of empire after the um, conquest all these types of conquests waged by samudra gupta so um it stretched uh, from the himalayas in the north to narmada river in the south and uh, brahmaputra river in the east to chambal river in the west so this is the territorial expansion of territorial we can say extent after the conquest of samudra gupta right cultural achievements if we see he is a great patron of arts so many coins uh, issued by him uh had uh, this thing he was playing veena uh on the i mean one coin minted like uh, in that he is playing veena so because and uh, under that under that image it is given as as kaviraja so in this way uh with that inscription or coin for the matter we come to know about the we can say interest of uh, samudra gupta in art and architecture or for that matter music right so he depicted as a skilled mus- a musician and a poet in his historical records especially the coins right next is ashwamedha it is believed that samudra gupta also conducted or we can say he held ashwamedha sacrifice he performed a ashwamedha sacrifice signifies signifying his imperial power so after that another ruler is the most significant ruler in gupta dynasty is the uh, chandragupta 2 so he is known for title vikramaditya right or alternatively he is also known as the chandragupta vikramaditya so vikramaditya it is a bit interesting and a very important title many kings after chandragupta 2 they have also started assuming this title vikramaditya so chandragupta he believed to have taken the title of uh, sorry chandragupta to he believed to believed to have been taken the title of vikramaditya right right so his rule is uh, i mean it is believed that he ruled between 375 to 450 so he is the son of uh, samudra gupta and uh, he ascended the uh, throne after uh, his illustrious father military com- uh, uh, campaigns if you see campaigns so he continued the expansion that has been started by his father right uh title of vikramaditya so some silver coins de- issued at that time i mean during his time depict the name uh, vikramaditya meaning that uh, literal meaning of that title is son of valior right 
so because of the popularity of this title later kings also they have also started i mean many of the later kings also started assuming this title vikramaditya right so it is believed that chandragupta had his capital at ayodhya so traditionally the guptan kings were continuing the tradition mauryan tradition of uh, maintaining their capital at or keeping the capital at pataliputra the modern day patna however it is believed that chandragupta too had his capital at ayodhya right apart from that the city pataliputra it continued to be flourishing uh, though the capital is at ayodhya the city uh, pataliputra continued to thrive right so he is uh, he is a rule he is known for peace and prosperity uh, uh, apart from hinduism apart from hinduism there is or there was tolerance for other religion uh, other religions also especially the buddhism right so buddhism also patronized at this time so many we can say nobles and also the queens they have commissioned the construction of various stupas buddhist stupas so buddhist stupas that is started construction of buddhist stupas that also started during the maurya period it even continued in the guptan era also so he, this shows the religious tolerance of the guptan kings right especially chandragupta 2 is known for uh, benevolent his benevolent, benevolent way of ruling and also for his religious tolerance right he is a great supporter of learning so he, uh, he actively patronized scholars and artists attracting renewed figures like astronomer varaha mihira and a celebrated poet dramatist kalidasa to his court right so this is about chandragupta too so one of the famous uh, chinese traveler also uh, came to india during uh, the time of chandragupta too only Uh, right uh, and he converted into buddhism that uh, famous uh, chinese uh, scholar and uh, he whenever he went to china and he uh, converted or we can say invited many other people into buddhism so in this way also buddhism spread in china during that time right so it is believed that chandragupta is believed to have been a follower of vaishnavism uh, vaishnavism or bhagavata bhagavatism also we can say it is a hindu sect of worshiping vishnu however he practiced religious tolerance allowing other religions like buddhism and jainism to thrive right we have already seen this next another uh, important ruler is kumaragupta right so inheritance he kumaragupta inherited a vast gupta empire from his father chandragupta to right so he also it is believed that maintained control over the entire so apart from that he also performed the ashwamedha asserting his authority right so he also uh, assumed the uh, assumed the title of maharaja the raja just like his great great grand father right right so apart from this title maharaja the raja he also uh, i mean assumed other titles like parama bhattaraka meaning supreme lord so these signify his we can say achievements also right so the last we can say strong ruler of the guptan dynasty is skanda gupta so he has to face increasing and violent kuna invasions and uh, though he was possible uh, it was possible for him to stop the incursions of huns but the later guptans they have failed to uh we can say face and hold the threats of kuna invasions so this information we will get from the uh bitari pillar inscription so that is attributed to him it mentions his victory victory over kunas uh likely kidartis uh preserving the guptan empire and its core territory right so internal conflicts uh the inscription also suggests that there are there have been some inter, uh, internal conflicts and uh, skandagupta he was able to uh, restore the fallen fortunes of the guptan empire so this uh, also shows that, shows that before him or the earlier period of uh, uh, skandagupta there were internal conflicts however 
he put an end to them and again he rose once again he restored the glory of the guptan empire all right so he known for his defense strategy uh, of the i mean in facing the hunas all right so this is these are the series of great rulers in the guptan dynasty right now we will try and understand the administration of the guptans all right so similar similar to that of the mauryas they also known for well organized and a centralized type of administration right so emperor he was the we can say top most figure in the entire administration process right so <clears throat> he held the supreme power and authority over military political administrative and judicial matters also right so they have assumed the titles like maharaja the raja so from then on it became a practice right so there was a council of ministers it is known as mantri parishad it is there to advise the king on various matters right so it comprised of high ranking officials who advised the emperor on various key administrative matters some of the key officials in the court are or uh, are senapati he is the supreme i mean commander of the commander in chief of the uh, armed forces kumara mat <coughs> kumara amacha so he is the the provincial governors who oversaw the administration in mover uh, sorry major provinces provinces are at that time known as buktis so kumara amatyas they were heads of the provinces adhikari adhikaras so officials in charge of specific departments like revenue collection justice etc they are they are known as adhikaras next are <coughs> uh pustapalas so these these are record keepers they are known as pustapalas <coughs> they maintain the official documents and records including accounts so if you see the provincial and the local administration first are buktis the provinces are known as buktis the entire kingdom is divided into provinces <coughs> like buktis bagos and pradeshas right so these provinces they were further subdivided subdivided into district so districts at that time were known as vishayas and villages villages are at that time known as gramas right vishayas so each district was headed by a vishayapati who was responsible for maintaining land law and order collection of uh, taxes and supervising local administration villages if you see so the village the smallest it was the smallest uh, administrative unit it was governed by a headman called gramapati right or gramadyaksha right so villages had a significant degree of autonomy in managing their own local affairs taxation system so if you see land revenue was the major source of income for the uh, we can say empire right other taxes were also levied on trade crafts and other economic activities however land revenue was the major we can say revenue source of revenue for the empire military they had a large standing army <coughs> right so to defend their vast empires military invent- innovations so <coughs> they uh, they i mean <coughs> unlike the mauryans mauryans have increasingly or majorly dependent on the elephants uh, the guptans so not like that guptans uh, incorporated cavalry archers and heavy sword cavalry uh, into their we can say army making their military more versatile and effective right so what the po- point here is they they did not depend morely on the elephants right so decline if you see there are certain internal f- factors like uh, succession struggles could have been there and economic strain also is there so the maintenance of the vast empire it became increasingly expensive the cost of main, main maintaining large army and dealing with external threats for dealing with external threats it has become costly and unmanageable social discontent is also there so uh, because of the issues or unequal distribution of land and neglect of rural areas it also Uh, some historians opine that it also contributed to the decline of the guptan empire external factors the most important factor is the huna invasions so uh, during the period of 5th century ad 
the empire increasingly uh, faced the invasions from the hunas so we can say it is the most prominent reason for decline of decline of gupta empire apart from that uh, this period is also seen the rise of regional kingdoms and they have state started asserting their authority and independence so the gupta empire had to uh, forego its control over all these empires right so these kingdoms gradually challenged the gupta control over territories leading to gradual fragmentation of the empire right so uh, by the end of uh, we can say by 550 the guptan empire ceased to exist right. so this is about the guptan empire so mostly i have concentrated on the chronology only so if you have the idea about the chronology and some aspects about the administration you will be in a position to address uh, at least uh, at least uh, i mean you will be in a position to at least eliminate the options and uh, you might have uh, you can arrive at the answer uh, in the prelims examination right so uh, that is my intention right so now we will see some questions that are asked from this uh, topic in the previous exams first question it is asked in 2021 question is uh, from the decline of guptas until the rise of harshavardhana in the early 17th century which of the following kingdoms were holding power in northern india so uh, this is the reason i am much more focusing on the dynasties so you may expect a questions broader questions like this also so here you should have a general idea about the all the dynasties uh, in the i mean both in the ancient time and also in the medieval period so here the options given are sorry the kingdoms given are the guptas of magadha the parmaras of malwa the pushyabhutis of thaneshwar the mokaris of kanauj the yadavas of devagiri and uh, the maitrakas of vallabhi so among these so the yadavas basically we consider them as the uh, medieval kingdom right so the parmaras of Ma uh, malwa also they are mostly the we will consider them in the uh, medieval age not in the uh, ancient period so though even if we are consider them in the ancient period also they came later part so the parmaras are mostly the rajputs they are one of the rajput kingdoms one of the rajput kingdoms so it came we can say uh, we uh, mostly they have arrived on the scene after we can say in the later part of the ancient uh, period also in the early part of the medieval period so the correct option is uh, guptas were there pushyabhutis were there mokaris were there and the maitrakas were there so correct option is option b 1 3 4 and 6 are correct right so in this way you should have a broad idea about the dynasties also next question uh, i think it is asked in 2020 question is with the reference to the scholars or literate uh, literates uh, of ancient india consider the following statements uh, the statements are parini is associated with pushyamitra amarasimha is associated with harshavardhana Kalidasa is associated with Chandragupta too. So among them, only third statement is correct. The famous playwright uh, Kalidasa, poet and playwright, he is associated with the Chandragupta too. So it is uh, believed that Chandragupta has invited Kalidasa to his court. So the above two sentences are incorrect. So when we cover the art and culture topics also, you will be in a better position to answer this question much more. Uh, in a, you will be in a much more better position so however this already we have studied already this one so the correct option is option c only statement three is correct right so uh, this is it for today thank you thank you for joining the class see you next time until then have a good day. let's see you next